a faithful sharing of his uh, adventure thus far and uh, meeting up with a gentleman by the name of Shame. And uh, we finished off last week with Shame saying, Greetings, dear faithful. And so let's pick up the story where it goes on from here. Same to you, sir, I answered, happy to meet a fellow pilgrim. And what is a fine-looking chap like you doing down here in this lowly scrub of a valley? He asked contemptuously. What? What? Why tis the way to honor? Ah, so I take it that you consider yourself bound as I am. Aye. Then he got an arrogant air to his carriage and said haughtily, Don't you know that this is not the way? What? I cried. This cannot be. Ah, tis even so, he said with unyielding confidence. What proof have you, I demanded. The greatest of proofs, he said, motioning first up, then down the path. Look about you. How many others do you see trudging along this miserable way? Well, I had to admit, at this moment, none. Aha, uh -huh, he continued, following up his advantage. And how many great men have you met with since you began your pilgrimage? None. And rich? None. And mighty? None. And wise? None. There be good reason for that. What? I asked, growing weary of his grating manner. Chiefly this, he said with a twisted smile. Tis because there is no such place in all the universe as this Mount Zion. You chase a green rainbow pursued only by the ignorant and foolish. Nay, but yea, he shot back as he stepped closer. The only people you are likely to meet on this journey are the poor, the weak, the lowly, and the ignorant. They are humble, because they have no choice, he snapped acidly. They have no speed of mind, nor might, or muscle wherein to glory. So what is left to them but to affect great humility? Then they turn about and take great pride in not being proud. Why, I, uh, I see you to be at a loss of words, he gloated. And while you should be, he continued, crossing his arms and stepping yet closer, for there is no defense for your feeble position. Tis unscientific and foolish to think that this world was created in six literal days, and that by nothing more than the command of some imaginary god. But, but you did not take into account that... Hear me out, he interrupted, poking a bony finger into my chest. Do hear me out, he demanded, pushing me back a step and emphasizing his words with painful jabs. Just ask among any who have ha been educated by the establishment. I assure you that they will find it slim pickings indeed to meet even one who dares entertain such foolish notions. Now wait just a minute, I tried to interject. Aha, he spat out victoriously as he came nose to nose and glared down at me with piercing bloodshot eyes. Do I perceive thee to be glowing a little reddish in the cheeks? Shame on you, wimpy pilgrim. Your anger shows my words to be true. Nay, nah, not so. I verily so, he shouted, his perifec breath directed straight into my upturned face. For if there were such a God as you believe in, he would at least have power enough to keep your spirit from boiling over. He does, I answered quietly, by God's grace. Or else I would have crowned you by now. Ah, tisk, 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 he mocked. What a shame that you are under the control of another and can no longer do what you would. Nay, I continued, but rather lucky for you that the spirit warreth against the flesh. For I tell you, true sir, that before becoming a pilgrim, I was a man of strong passions and would have bent your nose long ere this. Ha, ah, sneered he. What a shame that mere words from the lips of some foolish preacher can make you repent of imaginary wrongs. And what a shame that you must go round to all of your neighbors to make right those imaginary wrongs. Tis a joyful duty for a pilgrim to make right all known wrongs, I countered. Nay, he answered contemptuously, pushing me back with another painful jab of his long forefinger. Tis only a false humility in which the weak-minded take great pride. Nay, I returned, standing my ground to my great pain and to his greater surprise. Yea, he snarled right into my face. If I recollect correctly, dear Christian, he had swollen reddish gums, crooked yellow teeth, and a couple of decayed molars. Your strict standards have separated you from many a fine and a great man, he continued. 
and why why just because you happen to see them indulge in a few little faults such as spending a bit of time at the ale house or swearing by the Christ or doing some other pretty nothing, petty nothing? They are not petty nothings in God's eyes, I answered firmly, still standing my ground. Bah, he snorted, glowering down at me with both hands on his hips. God has no eyes. At this, I felt a holy boldness, and after taking a deep breath, I stepped right up to him and said softly, nose to nose and eye to eye, it is becoming clear to me that you have forced me to a point of decision. Between what, he sneered, trying to maintain his advantage. Between the mockings of science falsely so called and the word of God, I said, advancing a step and unbalancing him. Between wisdom and foolish imaginations, you mean, he snapped contemptuously, giving back a step. Nigh, said I boldly as I command, commandeered another step, but between life and death. And it is my decision that the worst foolishness of God is wiser than the best wisdom of men. Therefore, I will believe God's way to be best, even though all the so-called great men of the world be against it. Foolishness, he sputtered, now on the defense. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned, quoted I, and I perceive that you are spiritually blind. What? Do you begin to revel me? Nay, but I speak the word of God concerning you. At this he winced and made as if to cover his ears. Therefore, since God prefers that we believe his word rather than the idle speculations of so-called scientific men, I will believe him. I am unscientific. And since God prefers a tender conscience, I continued, I will not violate mine. Bah, womanish, he sneered. And since God calls them wise who become as fools for the kingdom of heaven, I will gladly be called a fool by thee and wise by he. Tis foolishness, all foolishness, he managed to stammer. So say you, said I, firmly walking forward into his continued retreat. But seeing that you are spiritually blind and wretched, poor and naked, your words have no weight with me. The fact is that they serve to confirm the truth of the word of God, which says that in the last days men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, false accusers, fierce, despisers of those that are good, and many other things which you and your so-called great men do fulfill. Such insult, shame on you. Such truth, I shot back undaunted. Therefore, since the poorest disciples of Christ is richer than the wealthiest king, and since the most foolish of his children are wiser than your greatest philosophers, I say unto you, shame, depart. At this, shame stopped his retreat, grasped my collar with both hands, and with his homely face bent down over mine, growled threateningly, I must inform you, dear faithful, that shame is the most difficult one to leave behind. Away, I commanded, trying to break his grip and get upwind of his noxious breath. Nigh, he sneered, clinging tenaciously against my struggles. Must I call against you the word of God? I challenged, or will you go peaceably? All right, all right, he screeched, as bony fingers unclenched and thrust me back. Have it your way, foolish pilgrim, he continued more quietly, but with bitter scorn dripping acidly from every word. I shall depart for a time in a season. But I shall never be far from your ear. The voice of shame thou shalt ever hear. Fare thee, poor. And so did he actually leave you, asked Christian, who had hung entranced upon every word. I finally nodded faithful, visibly wearied by the mere recitation of his encounter. But only after I had greatly exercised my faith and brought out the word of God against him. When he finally departed, God did give me a verse which I spoke thus. The trials that those men do meet withal, they are obedient to the heavenly call, are manifold and suited to the flesh, and come and come and come again afresh, that now or sometime else we by them may be taken overcome and cast away. Oh, let the pilgrims, let the pilgrims then be vigilant and quite quit themselves like men. Ah, my brother, said Christian thankfully, I am glad that you showed such courage against that villain. 
He will, no doubt, dog our steps all the way to the kingdom and try to make us ashamed of that which is good. I nodded faithful. I fear we have not seen the last of him. But at least we can take comfort in the words of Solomon. Which ones? Those that say, the wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the promotion of fools. Ah, tis a worthy saying, and should be bold enough to show his face again, we shall more quickly cast against him the word of God. Ay, but do tell. Did you meet any others along the way? Nay, but I had sunshine all the way, and even through the darkest of the valley of death, I felt the presence of God's Holy Spirit. But do tell, what adventures have you had along the way? Then did Christian recount all that had befallen him on his journey. After this, I saw in my dream that faithful chance to cast a glance behind them where at some distance he saw a man walking. He was a tall man who was much better looking at a distance than when seen close at hand. Upon seeing him, faithful called out, saying, Ho, oh, friend, where off to? Perchance to the heavenly country? Why, verily I am, answered the man merrily. Why, then come catch up, that we may have your good company. Then Christian said softly, Caution, dear faithful, I think that with a very good will shall I be your companion, interrupted the man trotting up eagerly. A very good will indeed, indeed with a very good will. Come, friend, said faithful with a smile, let us talk about our Savior or something else worthy of our time. Oh, exclaimed the man, clapping his hands joyfully, so happy I am to hear you speak thus, so very happy. Good. There be so few along this way that choose to discourse upon serious spiritual matters, and this is such a vexation to my spirit. Oh, such a vexation. I can see it would be agreed, faithful, for what could be more worthy of our conversation than the things of God? Oh, I like you wonderfully well, for your speech is so full of conviction, and the beauty of it is that there are so many things upon which we may profitably discourse. Ah, that is true, and to be profited by such topics should be our goal. That's what I just said, quipped the man. Yes, and furthermore, ahem, ahem, he interrupted with a strange smile. Furthermore, by good conversation, we may learn that the great promises and consolations of the gospel. In addition, we may see how to refute false opinions, how to vindicate the truth, how to instruct the ignorant. Ah, agreed faithful. I am very glad to hear these things from you. Why, thank you, he said, doffing his wide-brimmed hat and smiling cordially. Then his countenance fell as he solemnly replaced his hat and said, Alas, tis because of the rarity of such talk that so few understand the need of faith and the role of a work of grace in their soul in order to inherit eternal life. But if I may say so, put in faithful, such heavenly knowledge is the gift of God. No man can come to it by mere talk. I agreed the man with a nod. That I do know right well and I could give you a hundred scriptures for the proof. Well then, seeing that we agree so well, what shall we talk about? Oh, of whatever you will, grinned the man with an expansive gesture. I will discourse of things heavenly or things earthly, things moral or things evangelical, things sacred or things profane, things past or things prophetic, things foreign or things near at hand, things more essential or things circumstantial, provided, provided of course, that all is done to our profit. So, what shall we talk about? Now, Faithful, a bit overwhelmed by the vast array of choices, decided to seek counsel of Christian. Uh, just one moment while I ask counsel of my companion here. Very wise of you, nodded the man, grinning broadly and folding his hands piously together. In a multitude of counselors, you know. Brother Christian exclaimed Faithful, do you see what a brave companion we have discovered here? Surely this man will make a very excellent pilgrim. When Christian responded with a wry smile, Faithful was puzzled and asked quietly, What's wrong? Why do you smile so strangely? Then Christian motioned for Faithful to come close before saying softly, This man with whom you are so impressed will do nothing but beguile you. What? Do you know him? Yea, he nodded, better than he knows himself. Pray tell then, who is he? His name is Talkative. He is the son of a man named Sewell with whom 
He lives on Pratting Row. What? He exclaimed faithfully loudly. Shh, whispered Christian, finger to his lips. What? asked Faithful more quietly. This man is talkative from Pratting Row. Aye, this man is happy for any company and content with any conversation. As he cheerfully discusses religion today, he will as eagerly compare the girls at the dance hall tomorrow. Indeed? said Faithful, still in shock. Yea, in fact, the more rum he pours into his crown, the more nonsense he rolls off his tongue. Religion has no real place in his heart or house or conversation. Well, said Faithful in amazement, stealing a furtive glance at their fellow traveler, I would never have guessed it. I have been quite deceived by him. As have many, nodded Christian, casting a quick look at the man who, catching his eye, waved gaily. Christian nodded courteously, but continued softly. He is one of them that say and do not. He talks freely of prayer, of repentance, of faith, and of the new birth, but talking of them is all he knows. Tell me more, whispered Faithful. His heart knows nothing of prayer, repentance for sin, and his house is totally void of religion. Verily, are you sure? Aye, to all that know him he is a stain on, a reproach to, and the shame of true religion. My, exclaimed Faithful under his breath, then he has surely caused the loss of many souls. Aye, and unless God stops him, he shall stumble many more. Then he is a hypocrite, nigh but rather deceived. He knows not that in the judgment, God will look for fruit rather than mere talk of fruit. Then it is this man that Paul <coughs> had in mind when he spoke of Sounding brass and tinkling cymbals, deduced faithful. Aye, but mere words he shall never earn a place in heaven, though he seems to speak with the tongue and voice of an angel. Is there any hope of converting him? Nah, answered Christian, casting another quick glance toward the object of their conversation. Again the man caught his eye and spread his hands as if to ask him patiently, Well? Christian held up a finger to indicate just a moment, and continued. Nay, he knows so much scripture that he considers everyone else a fool and so cannot be taught. Then it would be a waste of time to hear all this, his empty words. How shall we free ourselves of him? I don't want to be rude. There is no need for that. How then? Simply speak to him about the practical power of religion on his own heart. I'll guarantee that he'll lose interest right off. Well, that's easy enough, whispered Faithful. I'll give it the try. I shall pray God to give you wisdom, said Christian softly, as Faithful turned to talk of saying, Well, sir, back I am. Welcome, said Talkative with thinly veiled irritation. But what took so long? Oh, we could have been deep into some lively conversation by now. Well, better late than never, I always say, said Faithful cheerily. Let us go at it now, if you will. But of course snipped talkative. Do you have a question for me? Oh, yes. Many. Good, exclaimed talkative, crossing his arms and smiling confidently. Ask me anything, anything. Answer me this, then. How may a man know when the saving grace of God is actually in his heart? Well, uh, uh um, stammered the man a bit, taken aback. Uh, a very good question, to be sure. To be sure, a very good question, and I, uh, Answer you thusly, first, when the grace of God is in the heart, it causeth a great outcry against sin. Second, hold just a moment. Huh? Doc, the man stunned at being interrupted so early on his voyage into eloquence. Wouldn't it be better to say that it shows itself by causing the soul to hate its sin? Crying out against and hating? Hating and crying out against, what's the difference? Oh, a great deal. I have heard many a man cry out against the evils of drink while stumbling home from the alehouse. Hmm muttered the man under his breath, impatient to be getting on with his oration. Potiphar's wife, continued Faithful, could cry out against Joseph with a loud voice as if pure as if as the driven snow, but just the same she was quite willing to have him to her chamber. Bah, grumbled the man, you are picking at straws. Nigh just setting things straight, but do go on. Thank you, snipped the man, tersely, relieved to once again have the reins of his hands. The second evidence of grace in the heart is great knowledge of gospel mysteries. 
Do hold up again, interjected Faithful one more. For this is not needfully so. Uh, what? Stuttered the man, stunned at Faithful's audacity. Yes, for a man may possess all knowledge and yet be as nothing if he hath not charity. Straws, my good man, you be catching at details again. I think not. I certainly agree that we have need of knowledge, but it is our acting upon our knowledge that shows us to be true Christians. To know without doing is the same as not doing at all. As James has said, faith without works is dead. Hmm. A man may know like an angel and live like a demon. Therefore, your sign is not true. As King David said, give me understanding and I shall keep thy law. Yea, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Well, snapped talkative curtly, tis obvious that I value knowledge much more highly than you. Not so. I value it as greatly as you, if it be accompanied by action. But do go on. Give another sign to show that the works of grace is in the heart. Not I, thank you, declined talkative bluntly, for no matter what I say, you catch at straws. Then may I? I care not. Then answered Faithful, the work of grace shows itself to a man thusly. First, there comes upon him the great conviction of sin and the certainty of damnation, unless he finds mercy by faith in Jesus Christ. Then there comes a hungering and thirsting for righteousness, which appetites are fulfilled by Christ. Mm-hmm, intoned talkative, staring blankly out across the field. And in proportion to the strength or weakness of his faith in his Savior, so are his joy and peace. So is his love for holiness. So are his desires to know him more. And so is his determination to serve him well in this world. Then Talkative have stopped dead in his tracks, jabbed both hands onto his hips, and challenged. And uh, how does grace in the heart show itself to others? By confessing his faith in Christ. Aha! Brighton Talkative, feeling himself once again on vantage ground. By talking, you mean. I agreed, faithful, making Talkative's face shine all the brighter. And more, he continued, which once again drew a dark cloud over Talkative's countenance. More? snorted Talkative. What more? Much more, declared faithful, such as by a life that agrees with the talk. That is a life of holiness. Not by talk only, such as a hypocrite or Talkative person might do but by practical submission of the life to the word of God. Hmm, murmured Talkative, once again staring over the field with a dour expression. Do you have any objections to what I have said? Hmm, no, murmured Talkative. I suppose not. Carry on. Then with your permission, I have a second question to pose to you. Ah, very good, responded Talkative brightly, glad to change the topic. I love to answer questions. Yes, yes, questions I love to answer. Go on, do go on. Then Faithful grew serious and fixing his eyes on Talkative said, kindly, tell me, friend Talkative. Hold, hold, interrupted Talkative. I have not told you my name. How do you know it? Oh, you are quite famous in these parts, announced Faithful. My compa companion here told me all about you. Famous, you say, crowed Talkative with an expansive grin. Well, what do you know about that, famous? Hey, hey. Oh, uh, excuse me. You had a question, didn't you? Well, do go on. I love to answer questions. Questions I love to answer. Then under his breath, he said to himself, Hmm, famous, he said. Fancy that. Even knew my name. My, my. Hey, 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 hey. As I was about to ask, friend talkative continued faithful, earnestly. Have you experienced the work of grace in your heart? Then was talk of taken quite aback and stammered, What, what, why, why, uh, 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 um, and does your life and conversation testify there too? Or, uh, 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 stammered talkative at a loss for words for the first time in his life. Or is your religion found more in your words than in your life? Answer me in honest. Answer, I pray. For to call oneself righteous when life and neighbors testify otherwise is a great wickedness. Then Talkative drew himself up to his full height and answered haughtily, You have begun to meddle in things of private experience and conscience, which things I was not planning to discuss. I do not feel bound to answer you in these private matters of the heart, and so shall not. As you choose, said Faithful, pursuing the matter no farther for the moment.
After a few moments, Talkative broke the silence, saying, But tell me, why do you ask such personal probing questions? Well, answered Faithful, with a matter-of-fact shrug of his shoulders, You seemed so eager to talk about religion that I thought I might see if it was mere outer talk or true inner experience. Then Talkative bristled, crossed his arms tightly, and with narrowed eyes asked tersely, And have you come to any conclusions? Not yet, but so far I have heard nothing to belie the things I have heard about you. Things, snarled Talkative, bristling like a hedgehog. What things? That you are a man whose religion is long on talk and short on walk. What? hissed Talkative angrily. People say you are a dark stain upon the Christian name and that some have already stumbled at your wicked ways with many more in the same danger. Why, the nerve, exploded Talkative, his face livid with anger. They say also that you regard your religion with no more affection than you show for your alehouse, that your religion is on an equal footing with covetousness, uncleanness, swearing, lying, and vain company keeping it. Well, this is an insult, exploded Talkative, the veins beginning to protrude in his neck. A grave insult. Faithful, undaunted by his companion's explosive reaction, sent a shaft of truth deeper home yet, saying, not only that, but there is a proverb widely gone about regarding you. Proverb, screeched Talkative, beginning to tremble with rage. What proverb? Tis the proverb spoken of the whore, which says, as the whore is ashamed to all true women, so is Talkative ashamed to all true Christians. Well, his Talkative, feigning with great indignity at such cruel slanders, since you are so eager to believe any lie that floats into your ear and so quick to make rash judgments, I must conclude that you are some kind of peevish or melancholy fellow, not fit to converse with a Christian gentleman, and so I must bid you adieu. With that, he turned up his nose, spun on his heel, and stalked off, turning the air blue with bitter words not fit to set before the eyes of gentle readers such as you. But wait, faithful called after fast retreating form, there is much profitable conversation to be had. Not with the likes of you, shot back, talkative over his shoulder. Adieu. Well, good Christian, said Faithful, a bit sadly. There he goes. Aye, what did I tell you? Your words and his lusts could not see eye to eye. So he would rather part with your company than with his sins. Indeed, but do you think we should call him back? Christian shook his head sadly and answered, Nay, let him go. The, pos the apostle has said, From sh such withdraw thyself. But he has saved us the trouble. Besides, tis his loss more than ours. Yes, I suppose you are right, agreed Faithful ruefully. But I am glad to have had this opportunity to witness to him, for it may come to his mind again some day, and at least I have dealt faithfully with him, and so I am free of his blood. Oh, chuckled Christian with a merry twinkle to his eye. You did indeed speak straight on with him. Then growing serious once again, he added, something which is seldom done in this age. I agreed faithful. And I'll wager that this is the reason for so much sin in this church. And this is what makes religion to stink in the nostrils of those who pass by. I nodded Christian. Too many debauched and wink, wicked talkers are allowed into the fellowship of the godly. And these hypocrites confused the watching world, put a stain upon Christianity, and grieved the sincere. Oh, if only ministers were as true to deal with sinners as you have been, then they would either change their ways or find the company of saints too hot for them. Say, exclaimed Faithful, I've just had a poem come popping into my head. Oh, really? Let me hear it. Then Faithful spoke in a verse thusly. How talkative at first lifts up his plumes. How bravely doth he speak, how he presumes. To drive down all before him but so soon, as faithful talks of heart work like the moon. That's past the full and to the wane he goes, and so will all but he whose heart work knows. Now Christian and faithful were traveling through a long and weary wilderness, but because of their lively conversation and warm fellowship, the time passed easily from, for them until they found themselves near at its end. 
At this point, Faithful again chanced to cast his eye behind him and espied one coming after them. We'll continue with our reading next time.